Hello, and welcome to this lesson on spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates are another one of those coordinate systems that are a little bit daunting at first. They seem a little bit crazy. There's lots of symbols, there's lots of Greek going on in the expressions. Um, but once we get into it, we'll see they're not that complicated and they'll make some of our electromagnetics problems much, much easier to solve. So let's check out spherical coordinates. First things first, just like we did with cylindrical coordinates, let's go ahead and take a look at that XYZ plane that we are used to working with. So we got an X axis there, put a Y axis there, give us a Z axis, let's go ahead and label them X, Y, and Z. And let's imagine that we have a point here. And that point, in rectangular coordinates is got X and Y and Z as its coordinates. Now, let's say that it is sort of sitting right there on the XY plane. There's that going to the XY, or going to the X axis, that going to the Y axis, and then we've got sort of this line coming down from the Z axis. So we can see it's X, Y, and Z components of its direction. Now, when we convert this into spherical coordinates, so we're going to get a point that is of r, theta, and phi. And here's how that looks. If we draw a line out from the origin to that place on the xy plane, the first thing we'll get is that the angle between the x-axis and that line is our angle phi. If we draw another line out from the origin to the point itself, first off, that line is going to be our r, and then the angle between the z-axis, the positive z-axis, and r is theta. And that's the conversion, that's the transform from rectangular coordinates to spherical coordinates. Now, let's actually look at the functional transforms and see how we can actually make this happen. So, first let's look at the point transforms. How do we just convert x, y's, and z's to r's, theta's, and phi's? And we get this. x is equal to r sine theta cosine phi, y is equal to r sine theta sine phi, and z is equal to r cosine theta. And on the other side, on the spherical side, we have that r is just equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Remember that r, since the line extending from the origin, has to be greater than or equal to zero. Um, theta is equal to, this one gets kind of weird, the inverse cosine of z over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Or that's r. And remember that since it's an angle on the z-axis, we have 0 degrees is less than or equal to, theta is less than or equal to 180 degrees. So theta can never be greater than 180 degrees. And then finally, phi is equal to the arctangent, the inverse tangent of just x over y. So these are our point transformations. This is how we go from x, y's, and z's to r's, thetas, and phi's. Now the vector transformations are exactly the same as they were in cylindrical coordinates because the nature of these vector mechanics hasn't changed. We're gonna use the same structures for this. So imagine that we have a vector a in rectangular coordinates, that is to say it's got an x component times the x unit vector plus a y component times the y unit vector plus a z component times the z unit vector. And we want to convert that now to an r component 
times the r unit vector plus a theta component times the theta unit vector plus a phi component times the phi unit vector. Now, each of these components, a sub r, a sub theta, a sub phi, are just equal to some dot products. So the r component is equal to the x component times the dot product of a sub x and a sub r plus a sub y times, yeah, the a component times a sub y dot a sub r plus the z component times a sub z dot a sub r. And the same thing for the theta and phi components. We'll go and jot these down uh, relatively quickly. So that's a sub x times, or excuse me, the x component times a sub x dot a sub theta plus a, the a component times a sub y dot a sub theta plus the z component times a sub z dot a sub theta. And for the phi's we have a, sub a the x component times a sub x. I keep trying to call this the a sub x. It's getting confusing dot a sub phi plus the y component times a sub y dot a sub phi plus the z component times a sub z dot a sub phi. There we go. So there's our formulas. There's really nothing too terribly complex going there. It's just a little tedious and a little bit time consuming to write it all out, but everything there, if you follow it step by step, is really quite simple. The last thing we need is, just like we had with our cylindrical coordinates, we need our table of dot products so we can know what these dot products actually are, so we don't have to figure them out the hard way. So let's go ahead and make that table. Call this our dot products. And we'll have a sub x dot, a sub y dot, a sub z dot. And up top here we'll have a sub r, a sub theta, and a sub phi. So a sub x dot a sub r is equal to sine theta cosine phi. a sub x dot a sub theta is equal to cosine theta cosine phi. And a sub x dot a sub phi is equal to negative sine of phi. a sub y dot a sub r is equal to sine theta sine phi, cosine, or excuse me, a, a sub y dot a sub theta is equal to cosine theta sine thi, and a sub y dot a sub phi is equal to cosine of phi. a sub z dot a sub r is equal to cosine of theta, a sub z dot a sub theta is equal to minus sine theta, and a sub z dot a sub phi is equal to zero. So there's our dot products. Combined with that, our vector transforms, our point transforms, we've got everything that we need to convert from rectangular coordinates to cylindrical coordinates. So let's go ahead and work out an example. Suppose we have a vector field G, and it's equal to x, z over y times the x component unit vector, and that's all there is to it. Let's convert that to rectangular coordinates. So we just need to find the g sub r, 
g sub theta and the g sub phi. So let's start by finding the g sub r. And that's just going to be equal to the dot product of g and the unit vector of r. And that's equal to g of x times a sub x times a sub r. Since there is no a sub y or a sub z in this, we only need to do this one component. So that's going to be equal to xz over y times a sub x dot a sub r we saw from our table here is equal to sine theta cosine phi. And there we have it. Let's go ahead and bring in the x, z, y. So that's just from our point transforms. Remember that x is equal to, if we scroll to the top, r sine theta cosine phi. So that's r sine theta cosine phi times z. So we scroll back up, it's just r cosine theta. over y, which is r sine theta sine phi. And all that times sine theta cosine phi. So with a little bit of algebraic simplification, we see that we can do some things. We can eliminate some of these r's and the sine theta. We're going to be left with r times sine theta, cosine theta, cosine phi over, or excuse me, cosine squared phi over sine phi. And that's our g sub r component. Let's go put a box around that. Next up, we need the g sub theta component, which is equal to g sub x times a sub x times dot a sub theta, which is equal to x z over y times um, a sub x dot a sub theta, we saw is equal to cosine theta cosine phi. So we go back and drop all the same stuff in again, and we'll get that, remember x is equal to r sine theta, z is equal to r cosine phi, and y is equal to r sine theta sine phi, that's times cosine theta cosine phi. And like before, we do a little bit of algebraic simplification. We can eliminate, let's see, an r. We can eliminate the sine theta. And the rest of the stuff is there. So we're going to be left with 1r, um, cosine squared theta, cosine squared phi over sine of phi. And finally, we need to find our component g phi, which is going to be equal to gx times the unit vector a sub x dot the unit vector a sub phi, which is x z. See what I mean? Like it gets a little bit repetitive. It's not super tricky. It's just, like I said, repetitive. Um, a x dot a phi is equal to negative sine phi. And so we bring our x's back. That's r sine theta cosine phi times r cosine theta over r sine theta sine phi times negative sine phi. 
And with a little bit of simplification, we get that the G component of theta is equal to, let's eliminate some R's, some sine thetas, and we're gonna get R cosine theta. But we can limit the sine phi's as well, sine phi, sine phi. We'll still have that negative sine, so it's gonna be negative R cosine theta times cosine phi. And there we go, there's our phi component of G negative r cosine theta cosine phi. So we gotta put it all together now. And we get that our new vector field, g is equal to, we get r times sine theta cosine theta times cosine squared phi over sine phi times a sub r of the unit vector plus r cosine squared theta cosine squared phi over sine phi minus r cosine theta cosine phi times the unit vector a sub phi. And a little bit more simplification we can do here we can actually factor out um, r cosine theta uh, cosine phi and get r cosine theta cosine phi times um, sine theta oops, not squared cosine phi over sine phi times unit vector a sub r plus cosine theta, cosine phi, sine phi, a sub theta minus a sub phi. One more simplification step we can do here. The cosine over sine leaves us with our final answer. So g in spherical coordinates is equal to R cosine theta cosine phi times sine theta times cotangent of phi a sub r plus cosine theta cotangent of phi a sub theta minus a sub phi. And there's our final answer there. So there's an example of how we convert um, vector fields in rectangular coordinates into spherical coordinates. Um, hopefully you saw that while there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of writing, it's very tedious. Um, no particular step is all of that complex or difficult to do. You just gotta sort of sit down, enjoy it, take some time, and, uh, and solve these problems. So. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you guys in the next lesson. Thank you.